Hey, it's your old pal Chuck Dixon, your comic book insider, here to answer questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. <clears throat> First question today, Christopher Donald asks, Chuck, what did you think of the Cassandra Cain Batgirl? Curious to hear your thoughts. She was my wife's favorite. <clears throat> I thought it was a good addition. Uh, we needed a Batgirl, and Barbara Gordon was obviously out of commission and had been for a long time. And uh, the choice to replace her with a character as interesting as Cassandra Cain, I thought, was uh, a great idea. Scott Peterson and... Um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name. Kelly Puckett! Sorry, Kelly. I'm, I'm a big admirer of Kelly Puckett's work, if you've ever watched any of these videos. Scott Peterson as well. No slouch at writing. But uh, Kelly Puckett was... Uh, you know, continues to be a genius uh, and contributed a lot. Uh, he's sort of a secret weapon, an unsung hero of 90s Batman. <clears throat> but he contributed a lot of the subtext that's there in the books, at least for me. Um, he, he had thoughts and takes on the characters that I found fascinating. And I often employed a lot of the stuff he came up with uh, when dealing with characters that he had um, explored. A, a, a thoughtful guy, a real smart guy, a writer who deserves a lot more attention than he gets. <clears throat> Let's go back and look at any of his work on uh, the Batman animated books or uh, Batgirl. Or uh, he, he did a number of, uh, you know, one shots and specials and things like that. And then, not a ter terribly prolific writer, but, but one of the better ones uh, to work in the medium, in my opinion. And... Um, <clears throat> Cassandra came as a great character, complex character, a lot of um, challenges other characters don't have. I mean, she was illiterate, which I found really interesting uh, because of the way she had been raised. And, uh, you know, I got to write a few issues because, like I said, <laughs> Kelly wasn't very prolific. And even when he was writing with Scott Peterson, they would sometimes miss deadlines. And I would help buy them a little time. <clears throat> I wrote a couple of fill-ins. I think I wrote a fill-in arc, if I'm not mistaken. But I always enjoyed the character. I had a lot of fun. And um, uh, I believe it was Damian Scott on the artwork. That guy always delivered. So I, I like the fact that it was a unique take on the Batgirl character. And the book had a, its own feel, entirely its own look. And that was kind of neat. That was back in the days when they didn't want everything to look the same. <clears throat> when comic books weren't, uh, the major comic book companies weren't as corporate as they are now. And uh, left a little room for artistic expression. Matthew D. Reese. I think that's Reese. My youngest and I were just chatting about your runs on Robin and Nightwing. We had a back matter question. Do you know if any real cars were used as the inspiration for the Redbird and Nightbird from your 1990s run? <clears throat> My money is on a 1992 Honda CRX and a 1968 Pontiac GTO, respectively. Um, <clears throat> well, the Redbird came about because... I wanted Robin to have a car that he could use both as Robin and Tim Drake. <clears throat> I always had a problem with the Batmobile in that it's such a unique vehicle that it's not a vehicle you could actually park in public and not have people notice it <clears throat> or move through traffic and people not notice it. Hey, there goes Batman. I wanted a car that could transform from street legal to, you know, combat mode, basically. So... Tim Drake's, you know, normal car that he would drive to school or, or take girls on dates. It'd just be a normal car. But with the press of a button and the pull of a lever, uh, it became armored up and, uh, you know, ready for crime fighting. <clears throat> now, initially, I, I did a drawing of how this transformation would work. And the basic car is not based on any Honda or any other existing car. It was best based on the best car I could draw. <laughs> so, so the initial drawing of, of the Redbird going from street legal to Redbird mode, uh, I drew myself uh, as a guide for Tom Grummet, who was the artist who would be the first one to draw it. Because the Redbird first appears at the very beginning of the run of Robin's monthly book. Because if anyone remembers, the first arc deals with car thieves. And Robin needs a car <clears throat> to go after them. And uh, Batman's not about to lend him the Batmobile. So, 
so I did this drawing and I sent it to Tom. And then the licensors come along and they want to make a Redbird car. The, the Redbird apparently is going to appear in the next Batman movie. Uh, now it didn't, uh, but it was a motorcycle, but they called it the Redbird. Now, um, they won't, so I, the editors told me that Tom said that he didn't want to do a drawing for the licensors, uh, that my drawing would suffice. So I called Tom and I said, no, you don't want to do that because we're going to get participation on this vehicle and who knows how many toys they're going to make out of it. And um, you, the participation is going to go to the person who wrote it and the person who drew it. And I said, if they're both me, I'm the only one that's going to get money, Tom. And I'd feel better if you drew, because you're going to be the one drawing it from now on. I'd feel better if you did your own drawing of the Redbird to submit to the licensors and to submit for, per, to, for participation so that we both share in the creation of the Redbird. Because I don't feel right with my crappy little sketch <laughs> you know, being the picture of record for this participation agreement. And he was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, that's not necessary. And he, he was being, you know, way too nice about it. And I said, look, look, Tom, I promise you, if you do this drawing, uh, next time you see me at a con, you're, you're going to be a very happy man because it's going to be in a movie. And it has. It's been a toy a number of times. Um, <clears throat> and Tom was very happy. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's been a matchbox and a Hot Wheel and a Lego and all the rest of it. So, you know, good news for us. Um now, for a long time, they would they never referred to Robin's vehicle as anything. It wasn't the Redbird. It wasn't anything. But uh, for some reason, this started around 2009, and it ended recently. Because apparently there's going to be a kid show all about Batman's vehicles, and Redbird is going to be part of the show. So uh, Tom and I can make a little bit of coin, because the show is so obviously designed to market toys. I mean, why would you do a show about Batman's vehicles if you weren't planning on selling a bunch of them at Target and Walmart. Uh, so that's the, probably a lot more than you needed to know about the Redbird. But um, it wasn't based on any real car. The Nightbird, on the other hand, yes, <clears throat> you are very astute. 68 Pontiac GTO is the Nightbird. I even bought a model of it and sent it to Scott McDaniel. Um, now, again, my theory on what kind of car would Nightwing drive uh, was based on the idea of something he could park in public and wouldn't get noticed. And I went real down market with basically a muscle car that looked like it belonged to a guy who was still working on it. Um, in, in my mind, it had a matte black finish, a primer finish, and there were some rust patches and everything else. Just the kind of car that, yeah, it's a cool looking car, but it had been passed its day. And, of course, no one had any idea what was under the hood. You know, uh, I think I wrote that it had a McLaren engine under the hood. And it had all of the bells and whistles and everything else of, of a kind of a Batmobile, a muscle car cross with a Batmobile. Uh, but you could park it on the street. And one of my inspirations for this was uh, Larry Hama once told me that he knew a guy in New York. Because parking a car on the street in New York is problematic. <clears throat> this was in the days when you would put a sign on your window saying no radio so they wouldn't break into your car for the radio. And he knew a guy who made these sculptures, these very convincing sculptures out of latex and other materials. And basically it was a really messy, uh, <laughs> it was a mess or what appeared to be a mess that you could put atop the dash of your car. So you park your car in the city and you put this mat on top of the dash and it looked like, you know, an old coffee cup and some papers and a half eaten slice of pizza. <laughs> and so it just looked disgusting. So that if anybody was cruising along looking to steal a car, they would look in and go, oh, God, this guy's a slob, you know. Then when you came back to your car, you, you folded the mat, mat up and put it in the back seat <laughs> or, or in the console. But, uh, you know, it was made out of, this guy was, um, I think he was a theatrical prop maker. He made this just very convincing, slimy, icky, 
mess that you could put atop the dashboard. I thought that was clever. And it was kind of folded into the inspiration for the Nightbird. And, uh, and of course, my next regular artist in the book was Greg Land, who's a car nut, so he loved drawing it. I think he owned a Pontiac, or still owns a Pontiac GTO, if I am, if I am not mistaken. <clears throat> but uh, that's, uh, that's some good eyesight you got there, my friend. Hamilton Blues Lovers, not sure if this was asked before, but what are your thoughts on Disney owning CrossGen and then doing nothing with it? Is it the same situation as Ultraverse? Contracts gave creators a lot more money if the characters are used. Um, yeah, Disney basically came in on a fire sale. <clears throat> there was one other bidder at the auction to buy CrossGen, but he wasn't serious. <clears throat> he ran out of money pretty quick. And Disney basically picked up the whole thing for half a million bucks. Now, when you think that they spent $4 billion for the Marvel Universe, half a billion bucks was a real deal. And they got, like, everything that was at the facility. I mean, they got all the art. They got all the properties. They got, uh, I think they even rolled up the carpet. My only regret when I left CrossGen was that I didn't take my uh, computer tower with me. I should have, but I'm too honest a guy. <clears throat> and I think of all the stuff that I had on that computer that I should have taken with me, <laughs> but I didn't. But anyway, Disney got it for, for half a mil and then did nothing with it because that's what Disney does. They can buy stuff up just to make sure no one else gets it. And of course, you've got this rich, you know, panoply of stuff we created at CrossGen over the years, any of which could be turned into TV or feature films or whatever. And I'm sure that at this point, Disney has completely forgotten they own any of this stuff. So uh, you'll probably never see it again. Uh, Marvel made some half-hearted attempts, some say half-assed attempts, to uh, explore some of this material, but it never went anywhere. Uh, it's a pity because some of the properties, I mean, Way of the Rat, we were very close to a film deal on that uh, through DreamWorks, and it didn't happen. Uh, and, and we had filmmakers interested in a number of the other properties. I mean, these were top-level uh, filmmakers who wanted to get into the comics-to-movie entertainment chain that was just starting up when, when we were doing CrossGen. But uh, sadly, uh, you know, this stuff just sort of languishes in Disney's vaults, like so much stuff. That's the big problem with Disney, seriously, is that Disney thinks that they're expert at everything, um, just because they're Disney and they're not. They failed over and over again in uh, areas like video games and publishing and, and stuff like that. But they still think they've, they've got all the answers. And um, sadly, they were the only people willing to pony up money to buy CrossGen. Of course, this is before they bought Marvel. Maybe this was just, maybe they th thought they could turn CrossGen into Marvel. Maybe they thought they could mine CrossGen for... Uh, uh, more male oriented, more or more male oriented characters as they intended to do with Marvel and Star Wars when they bought them. Uh, the thinking at the time was that you know Marvel was or, or Disney was making all their money off of princess characters, which were a gold mine for them. But there was very little in the current Disney output for boys, and they they were looking for stuff. And I think that's one of the reasons they brought Cross Gen thinking they could find some male-oriented material. Uh, and then they bought Star Wars and they bought Marvel for the same reason, $8 billion total price tag, and then, of course, immediately began to feminize both properties uh, and turn everything into a princess story. So <laughs> that's Disney in a nutshell. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Joseph Donnelly III, I'm loathe to think that there aren't any more creative people out there. Do you think many writers and artists are just choosing to not make new ideas for the big two in hopes of holding out any good ideas they have for their own creator-owned items they, that they may be interested in for the future, thinking that they want to hold the rights for their own creations? Well, you can't really blame them, can you? I mean, uh, I remember a number of times when I was trying to break in at D.C., um, they would say, well, come up with a fantastic idea for the challenges of the unknown. You know, pitch us some great ideas for the challenges of the unknown. You know, that kind of thing. You know, pitch us some great ideas for elongated man. You know, just languishing, you know, properties they weren't doing anything with at the moment. And 
my idea was, well, if I came up with such a great idea for the challenges of the unknown, why wouldn't I pitch it to Hollywood? Why would I just give it to you? I mean, why don't you decide what you want to do with the challenges of the unknown and then assign me to write that, which is, you know, basically my history at DC. But for me to completely, you know, reboot this property that I'll never see a dime from because you own all of it. Uh, they don't pay you for variations of this stuff. And we discussed uh, Scott Peterson's and Kelly Puckett's Batgirl earlier. Uh, they don't get anything from that. If they made a Batgirl movie adapting those stories, they might get some story credit and they might get a few bucks for story, but they're not going to get anything for that character because she's a variation of Batgirl. So why would I want to, you know, reboot your characters that I'll never own and never see a part of? Um, and it's even worse when you get to Marvel because at least DC has a participation program. So if you create new characters and new gadgets, you see some money. At Marvel, you see nothing. Uh, you know, it's discretionary at Marvel. And it's not, you know, there's nothing on paper. They don't have to give you anything. In fact, according to Marvel, the, the return of original artwork is considered a gift. It's like a bonus. They're not they, you're not entitled to get your original artwork back. Things like that. These are the, the hard and fast and ugly rules behind a lot of uh, the comics you see. That they're created by people who are constantly looking at the bottom line. Uh, and really don't care about the ongoing history of this stuff and certainly don't care about the lives of the people who create them. So yeah, um, I can see where a lot of the current creators would go, you know, why bother? You know, I'll, yeah, I'll write something for you, but I'm not going to create anything new uh, or that startling or that different or that amazing. <clears throat> now to me, I was the same way, but you know, when I worked on Batman, when I worked on The Punisher, I did my best to work within the framework of those characters. You know, Punisher, I never really invented. I think I invented a couple of new villains, but there was no reason to. Because first of all, Punisher kills all of his villains. Uh, secondly, I was never going to see anything from it. You know, whereas on the other hand, at DC, I created tons and tons and tons of new villains. I mean, just at Nightwing, I created like two dozen new villains uh, and supporting characters and all the rest of it. Because like I say, the rewards were there. But, but for rebooting or recreating an already existing property, there's, there's no money in it for, for a creator. No, no back end. Sean Frazier, I have a question about the archetype of the anti-hero. Having recently watched the Dirty Harry films and with my experience consuming other notable anti-hero characters, I get the impression that an anti-hero is just an anti-social hero who is more likely to kill his villains and almost always villains whose crimes would make them worthy of death and has no problem with breaking the rules, which are often bureaucratic in nature. To me, this still makes the characters fundamentally heroic in nature. As someone who has written a lot of material for The Punisher, I'd love your feedback. Uh, yeah, anti-heroes, I mean, as you call them anti-heroes, I call them slob heroes. They're my favorites of, of any to write because they seem real to me. And everybody likes the rebel, the maverick, the guy who breaks the rules. I mean, Dirty Harry became popular during the rise in the crime rate in the 70s when it was apparent that law enforcement agencies and our judicial system were not um, not really willing to deal with the problem. <laughs> so so we cheered on guys like, you know, Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson who, who went outside the system to um, not take the law into their own hands, but, you know, deliver their own brand of justice. Uh, same thing with Judge Dredd. I mean, a lot of people look upon Judge Dredd as the villain in his own book. I suppose you could look at it that way. I mean, he's obviously a symbolic of a fascistic society. No, no one would want to live in Judge Dredd's world. But I kind of get the feeling that if you did live in Judge Dredd, Dredd's world, you'd be kind of glad Judge Dredd was around. So, so he is a hero because he is ultimately doing the right things, even if um, he's a bit harsh. Now, a true anti-hero is someone like Walter White on Breaking Bad. We're rooting for this guy, even though he's breaking every rule of the book. I mean, he's breaking the law, but we're rooting for him uh, because we've become sympathetic toward him and his family and, and his situation. And um, he's and, and, But the thing is that the creators are smart, 
and that they let us know over the course of the series, if you watched it, in the end, this guy's not a hero. That there's nothing admirable about him other than his ruthlessness when we get right down to it and, and his level of intelligence. Uh, but even when we find out that he is a bit of a prick, uh, we're still rooting for him because the people that he's dealing with are so much worse. And um, so to me, that's a true anti-hero, a, a hero who, who challenges your, your moral compass. And, you know, they're all over the place. The, the, the slob hero, the anti-hero, the, the person who's, you know, out for revenge, out for their own uh, battling people who are far more evil than they are. Uh, not people you would necessarily want to have in your life, um, but you're happy that they're disposing of the people that they are disposing of. And for that matter, I mean, James Bond is very much an anti-hero. And, it, you know, if you read the Bond novels especially, this isn't, isn't a particularly likable guy. <laughs> um, he's a bit of a dick. And um, e even when we get into his emotional life and, and things like that, which the movies don't really get into, that, that Bond does have a heart somewhere down inside there. But for the most part, he's a guy who, um, you know, likes the freedom offered him <laughs> by, by the license to kill and, uh, you know, the lifestyle that he's able to live off of the, uh, the, the, the taxpayers of the United Kingdom. <laughs> and, and he's into his own comforts and self-interest for the most part. Yeah, he's on the right side. He's fighting you know, world criminal organizations or he's fighting global communist threats. But, you know, at the bottom line, it's, it's keeping him in, uh, you know, cigarettes and vermouth. So, so there you go. I should say vodka. He doesn't drink vermouth for martinis, does he? It's always vodka martinis. And uh, that brings us to, to me, the ultimate slob hero is the Punisher. He embodies every negative male stereotype and he's unpleasant to be around. <laughs> he's not. The, the, Frank Castle is in no way a charmer. He's nobody's idea of a good friend. You know, you would not want the Punisher to drive you to the airport uh, or pick you up. <laughs> this would probably be a hundred guys chasing him. Uh, you know, and again, like Judge Dredd, Punisher's often seen as the villain in his own book. But, and, I, and I think he is because he's, he's not... Um, not very nice to the people around him. Even his allies are, you know, in danger from him, if not from his enemies, from, from Frank himself. And they're always in danger of disappointing him, which, um, and then being cut off. Uh, and the thing is, if you're part of Punisher's organization, you want the Punisher around. You don't want to be cut off by him because you might need him someday. But Frank doesn't care about that, which makes him, you know, uh, even beyond the spaghetti western level of anti-hero kind of anti-hero. So, I hope I answered that question. Uh, I'm bringing back something I haven't done in a while. Um, people seem to like these where I talk about an author. Of, a number of you have asked me about Richard Matheson. Was he an influence on my writing? Do I know who he is? You know, what's the deal with Richard Matheson? Uh, and here is the deal. Richard Matheson was a short story writer and novelist. Uh, he wrote right up until his death in 2013. Wrote throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Very, very influential. And I'm going to show you why if you don't know. And maybe you haven't connected all the dots. This has probably happened to all of us who, you know, who read or enjoy popular entertainment. We don't draw a connection between a lot of the things we like. And until finally we find out, hey, one person was behind all of these different things I liked and I never put it together, you know, but I liked all of them. So I'm going to look for more of him. Uh, the, the first time for me, Richard Matheson comes on the scene and I didn't know it was Richard Matheson is the incredible shrinking man, which was always running on science fiction week. at <laughs> Our local CBS affiliate, uh, the early show would have science fiction week and incredible shrinking man was always in the lineup. And, um, it's based on a novel by Matheson, and Matheson wrote the screenplay as well. If you've never seen it, it's it's a it's a it's a kick. It's one of the better 1950s science fiction films, and um, he also wrote a, a number of the best and scariest episodes of the Twilight Zone. 
and, uh, you know, just unforgettable episodes. And they're all written by Matheson. Of course, these were my favorite episodes of Twilight Zone, but I never put it together that they were all written by the same guy. And so, you know, this was, this was yet to occur to me, this revelation. Um, Matheson continues to write short stories, novels, things like that. And when he moves on to, you know, writing from Twilight Zone to writing screenplays for Roger Corman, uh, most notably, he writes a series of um, Edgar Allan Poe adaptations, you know, very loose adaptations for Roger Corman uh, to be run as, um, you know, drive-in fodder, basically. But they're intelligently written. Uh, you know, there's some humor, some tongue-in-cheek stuff. And, you know, he brings out all the best or, or most, I don't know, Grand Guignol uh, aspects of Poe for, for, you know, teenagers to enjoy <laughs> and I, I you know and i saw a bunch of these at saturday matinees and stuff and again never really put the name together now this is one i want to see this at a saturday matinee the last man on earth it's based on a novel by richard matheson called i am legend justifiably his most famous novel now i want to see it was a double bill it was a second feature on a double bill at a saturday matinee and the first movie, whose name I cannot recall, was some British import horror film that was so boring <laughs> that most of the kids left as soon as it was over. And I was literally the only kid left in the theater when Last Man on Earth started. And, <laughs> and within 60 seconds of the opening of this film, I was riveted to my seat. And I loved this movie. Uh, Vincent Price is, is Richard Neville. He lives in a world where he's the last human being alive. The rest of the population of the world has been turned into vampires. And he spends his nights, you know, drinking himself into a stupor, fending them off as they try to get into his house. And he spends his days hunting them finding the places where they sleep so he can reduce their number. And um, this movie made a huge impression on me. I just loved it. And as you can probably guess, a lot of other horror filmmakers did as well because this is the beginning of the zombie genre. Uh, this is what inspired Night of the Living Dead, which went on to inspire all of the other you know modern zombie films. It all starts with the last man on earth. Now, I, I didn't, I was a kid. I didn't think about novels, you know, that these movies came from somewhere. And it was years later, maybe three or four years later. You know how it seems like an eon when you're a kid. Um, <laughs> well, half an eon later, I'm at a, a book fair. We, we would have these book fairs at my junior high school. And people would donate books, and then they would lay them out in the library, and you could buy them. It was like, you know, 10 cents or a nickel for a paperback. And I bought a whole big stack of paperbacks, and this was one of them. And I thought, yeah, right, you know, this is all hyperbole, blah, 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 but it looks interesting, right? And it wasn't until I started reading it that I realized, hey, this is that movie. This is the book that movie was based on. And the book, wow, does the book deliver. It, this is an awesome science fiction novel if you've never read it. Um, and the movie is a pretty faithful adaptation of the book. It's, it, it suffers from being shot in Italy um, simply because it, there's kind of an otherworldly feel to it. It doesn't feel like the United States at all, which it's supposed to be. And, and that's kind of, but when I was a kid, I didn't notice any of that. But the novel, it, it just works and it's got a killer ending. Just an absolute killer ending. Well, now I was hooked on Richard Matheson. I didn't know everything about the guy. And I looked for all, everything he ever wrote, you know, all those different horror and science fiction anthologies and everything else. His World War II novel based on his own experiences, which is a terrific World War II novel about you know, a bunch of young men uh, involved in the fighting against the Third Reich. And um, a lot of, you know, obviously, personal detail and stuff thrown into the book. Very effective. Um, and not often, you know, it wasn't ever made into a movie or anything else. So it's not one of the more famous 
World War II novels. You know, a lot of World War II vets wrote novels, and, and Matheson, you know, delved into it. Uh, Hell House um, was made into a film as, as Matheson begins to move into A pictures. He's, he's got a reputation. He's getting noticed. Um, you know, and he's going strength to strength, moving away from writing prose and writing movies and television. He wrote this, the teleplay Duel, which was Steven Spielberg's first directing gig, I, I, if I remember right, a movie of the week that uh, got enormous ratings. Uh, Dennis Weaver being stalked across the California desert by a, uh, a crazy guy in a semi-truck. And, of course, Kolchak, the Night Stalker. Now, Matheson didn't create Kolchak, but he did write the first Night Stalker TV movie, which was a ratings sensation. I think they re-ran this movie like four times on ABC that year because the ratings were so huge for it. And he continued on in TV writing horror anthology movies. Uh, the most famous is Trilogy of Terror, which ends with Karen Black being chased around by the Zuni warrior a little uh, Maori uh, sculpture that she gets as a gift that turns out to be homicidal. And, uh, you know, he moved on to, you know, Somewhere in Time and you know, a number of other, you know, A pictures were either had screenplays by him or were based on uh, novels or short stories that he wrote. Now, all of that makes Matheson an extremely admirable writer. I mean, he basically created the modern horror story. Stephen King would not exist today. He would, he would still be a school teacher in Maine um, if, if, if it wasn't for Richard Matheson. Richard Matheson taught everybody how to move the horror story out of the Gothic castle and, and into your living room uh, or, or into the laundromat or some other place familiar. He brought the, the, the horror story to the modern world. He took away all the Gothic trappings. And that's the biggest thing he did. Um, that was, to me, his biggest accomplishment was to take all that stuff and modernize it and make it more relatable and therefore more scary. Uh, so anyone who makes anything in the horror genre today owes an awful lot to Richard Matheson and, and, and I'm sure would acknowledge it. Now, in one case, it wasn't acknowledged. <laughs> and another reason to admire any writer to admire Richard Madison. The movie Poltergeist is so obviously ripped off from two Matheson stories without crediting him. Uh, it, it's a combination of Little Girl Lost, which was an episode of Twilight Zone, and another Matheson short story whose, I think it was called They Bite. And it's um, about creatures that come out of a television and, and kill a family. That they live in a world on the other side of the television. So these two stories are put together, you know, totally ripped off, turned into poltergeist. Matheson sued Paramount. He sued everybody, <laughs> and, and rightfully so. When I saw Poltergeist, I thought, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I know this story. And anybody did. And, you know, for the filmmakers, I mean, for Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg, who probably never missed an episode of Twilight Zone, to say that they had no idea, no idea that they that, that these other stories had ever existed. They thought that this came right out of our own little heads. Uh, you know, yeah, nobody believed them. And a jury didn't believe them. And they rewarded Richard Madison an undisclosed sum. And if you know anything about Hollywood and the film business, when they finally get caught with their pants down and their hand in the cookie jar... An undisclosed sum has got a lot of zeros. So good for you, Richard Madison. You struck a blow for every writer who's ever been ripped off, you know, knocked down, had their pockets picked, or went without credit. So uh, if you write horror or if you write anything, you, you owe something to Richard Madison. It's worth checking out. And I know all of you have authors like this where it's like, hey, I didn't realize this guy wrote all these things. I love all these things. And, and it's one guy. Or one, or one woman, you know, did all these things that, that, I, that I responded to. So a uh, little bit of me geeking out over Richard Matheson. Hey, if you have a question, suggestion, you just want to contact me, you want to show me some artwork, you know, I don't care. Contact me at brunobookstore at gmail.com, brunobookstore at gmail.com. 
And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arc Haven, Arc Tunes, free, digital, high res, comics, new episodes every week. You're going to love it. You go there, check it out. There's going to be something you want to follow weekly. I've got something big there. Go Monster Go, My Sister Suprema, and more to come. We're adding more stuff all the time. Lots of independent producers from all around the world are coming to Arc Tunes. Maybe we're getting close as I record this, but maybe when you're watching this video, we'll have reached 3 million views. We're growing. We're growing. Be a part of it. And uh, that's it for me this week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking and sharing and subscribing and all the rest of it. And I will see every single one of you down the road.